This podcast is part of the Everyday Heroes Podcast Network, the network for first responders and those who support them. Disclaimer. All views expressed on what makes us fire are solely those of the person or persons giving them. What Makes Us Fire does not represent or claim to represent any particular city or fire department, and therefore make the claim that all views and standpoints are affiliated with What Makes Us Fire and with What Makes Us Fire only. Any mention of certain fire departments or cities within the interviews are solely for informational and opinion-based dialogue. In short, if you have a problem with what's published, just say something about it and don't be a Richard. Hello, everybody. This is Josh, your host of the What Makes Us Fire podcast. Thank you for joining us on the show today. Before we get started, a couple of announcements. October 14th and 15th in San Antonio, Texas, we are doing the Great Londini Meetup, benefiting Tadsaw, Train the Dog, Save a Warrior. If you haven't gotten your tickets yet, get them now. You can go to thegreatlondini.com and or whatmakesusfire.org. Get your tickets, come out, have a great time with us. Shelly Belly will be performing a comedic set for us. You'll be able to meet a lot of your favorite creators on social media. And they invited me to MC the event. So then you can come see me. And that'd be, I love coming out there. I love seeing you guys. And I love just interacting with everybody that comes out and supports our civil service members. Uh, Second thing, November 11th and 12th in Web City, Missouri, just north of Joplin, Missouri, we have the Break the Silence concert series kicking off for the What Makes Us Fire Foundation. We have a bunch of amazing artists. We have some pretty big creators coming out there. We want you guys to come out and have an amazing time. All proceeds are going to be split between the What Makes Us Fire Foundation and the city of Web City. Get our firefighters, police and EMTs and our military, some of those things that they want and need in the city. You can get your tickets for this event, for the meet and greet and VIP event at whatmakesusfire.org under the events tab. The meet and greet event is a ticketed event. The concert itself is free. So even if you can't get a meet and greet ticket or you can't get that VIP pass for the concert day to go backstage and everything, you can still come out and enjoy the music for free and show your support just by being there and showing those civil service members that are gonna be there how much you do support them. So again, check it out, whatmakesusfire.org. We also have some pretty cool swag at whatmakesusfire.org. Go to the whatmakesusfire.org store. You can get this cool nifty little hat. You can get our shoes. We have hoodies. Banana, bananas, bandanas. Uh, I don't know why I said bananas, you guys. I'm a little bit all over the place this morning. I just got off work, uh, 48 hour shift. So you have to excuse me. Um, But yeah, and in saying all that, our guest today, uh, I don't know how to say this. He is someone that is sharing a story that is pretty, pretty unique, Uh, pretty crazy. Al is a suicide survivor. And when I say a suicide survivor, I mean he completed the action of suicide but ended up surviving. I want you guys to listen really hard um, and listen to his story, listen to the words that he uses. His outlook on life has completely changed. He is someone that does love unconditionally and sometimes to the point where it can be detrimental. There's a point where we talk about loving unconditionally does not mean allowing that person to be toxic in your life. You can still love them and who they are, but you don't have to have them in your life. And Al learned that. I do also want to put a little asterisk here. Um, Because of his suicide attempt, some of what you're going to hear is going to be a little hard to understand. Uh, Al's missing a good portion of his tongue um, and a portion of his face uh, due to his attempt. But he doesn't shy away from having the conversation. So please bear with me. Listen in as hard as you can. And if you need to, just rewind so you can catch what he said even better. Uh, If you're watching on YouTube, I did my best at putting subtitles 
and that way you can watch and listen and see what he says a little bit better. All right, without further ado, without saying too much else, ladies and gentlemen, my friend Al, better known as The Hurtin Alberton on social media. So this is your first podcast. Yes. I'm surprised. Nobody else has reached out for you to share your story on this for, on this Shit kind of format. You. Shit shows you people have, but they've all been no shows. I've had lots of no shows. Lots of no shows. Okay, so you're obviously wanting and willing to share your story and everything, right? Oh, totally. Uh, there's only about from the statistics and find only about 5% of people will publicly, openly admit they tried taking their own life. Right. And out of that, out of them all, there's only about 0.5 of a percent that are open, honest, and willing to talk about it openly. Right. And I and, do that. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted you on the show. Uh, by the way, uh, everybody, this is Al. Al, welcome to the What Makes Us Fire podcast. Thank you for joining on the show. Uh, thank you for allowing us to be the first podcast that you're on. Everything goes here. We're just having a conversation. And so mm -hmm. don't worry about anything. We're going to dive into everything that you talked about. And just for the listeners and everything, if I ask like for you to repeat something, I'm not trying to be rude or anything. I just want to make sure that we get as clear of a sound as possible. So, whoa. Hold on. My lights just went out. <laughs> oh, no. Give, give me one second. Hold on one second. No problem. And I know that I don't speak normally because I only have a third of my tongue left. So it was a uh, battle to learn how to speak again. So, yeah, I know I'm so used to people asking, what did you say? You say it again. It's no big deal to me. It's just part of my everyday life now. Did you lose all your power? Uh, no, no. I just just the the power to the light. That's why I went completely dark. And now, oh, I plugged the wrong one in. How about that? Hold on. Oh, no problem. You would think I'd have this. You would think I'd have this all figured out by now. Ah. We learn things as we go. Same as my life is. Uh, I learn things new about my situation. And everything else, all the time. We're right. Forever it, learning. Right. Right. When you think you have everything figured out something or someone tries to be like <laughs> you had no idea <laughs> and of course i'm knocking some stuff over okay what a great way to start a podcast show everybody um al i promise you i've done this before i know it doesn't seem like it right now <laughs> dropping oh. everything <laughs> my light just no. went out all of a sudden but it's, it's real to me because it shows that Mistakes happen in life all the time. All the time. I don't time. get upset about things like that. It's just part of life. You're absolutely right. It is just part of life. It happens. Um, I'm going to flow with it. Anyway, uh, again, thank you for coming back on the show. I really do appreciate you sharing your story here on the What Makes Us Fire podcast. Um, just a real quick question. Do you have any type of military or first responder background? I was in EMT. You were an EMT. Okay, so this is perfect. Yeah. You fall right in line with uh, with what we're all about, our civil service members. And even if you didn't, you still fall in line with the mental health aspect and what you went through in your story and how you've overcome that. For everybody that doesn't know, uh, Mr. Al here is a suicide survivor. And it's not often that we hear that term, suicide survivor. Uh, it's no. e either it's an attempt, uh, a failed attempt, you know, we just don't hear that suicide survivor very often. And Al has made it a mission to share his story in hopes that he 
touches someone else to not make the choices he made, but to make better choices and to better their lives in the future, as he has done since his um, since his suicide attempt. And you know me, I don't sugarcoat anything, so I'm going to call it like I see it. Uh, Al, brother, I like to start with where you come from. Uh, let's let's start off with where you come from, where you grew up and how you grew up. And the reason why I like to do that is I'd like to get a little bit of a background of the person you were before the mental health crisis started, just to get an idea of what kind of life you were living up to that point. Well, I'll, I'll make it fairly brief with that. Um, I was brought up in upper class family in Victoria, BC, Canada. Victoria, BC. We weren't okay. lower class. We were upper class. But I, shortly after I left home, I was the black sheep of the family. I really was. I was treated like the black sheep of the family, too. Uh, I was heavily, heavily into sports before that, but I ended up falling in with uh, a lot of black sheep, other people. One percenters. One percent and black sheep. One, one percenters. Black percent sheep. Black sheep of the one percenters. I was a one percenter. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, so and I got out, but I won't go into that story because I don't like to talk about it. Okay. And there's reasons why, but I got out, and the biggest things that really changed me were my kids. Your kids? My kids changed my outlook on life a lot more. Okay. But I moved from Victoria, B.C. to Alberta, Canada, northern Alberta for work. And I love it up here. I really do. It may get cold, but I enjoy the cold. You enjoy the cold? And, uh, the biggest change is uh, I ended up going from a black sheep to a really, really, really positive person. Mm -hmm. And I ended up taking a fair bit of my family members and boxing. Because to what? me, family isn't blood. No, you, you ended up doing something with your family members. I'm sorry, say that again. I blocked them. Oh, you blocked uh, took them. Took them out of my life. Oh, okay. Doesn't mean if they're blood, they're good for you. No, I, I, I'm all I, about good karma. I believe that. I believe that no matter who the individual is, if they're toxic, they're toxic. And sometimes blood is not thicker than water for sure. Uh, what was what was childhood like for you? I mean, you say you grew up in a pretty privileged home, but you as you were growing up, you turned into a black sheep. Did you have uh, siblings? How was the relationship with your with your parents like? With my dad, really good. My mom died in 1972. Okay. I was eight years old when she died. But I, my grandparents helped uh, raise me for a little while. But I actually had a very good childhood. I was never beaten on. I wasn't abused. My parents, even my stepmom, were really, really good to me. I had a good childhood. I was lucky that way. Did you have any? Did you have any siblings growing up? How do I explain this? My uh, mom, before she married my dad, had three kids, put okay. two of them up for adoption. So I grew up with one for eight years. Then my she left, and my mom died, and uh, my dad remarried. So I had two step brothers and a step sister. And yeah, how, I, I, you know, at eight years old, it, it's interesting. You know, I like to dig a little bit into the past because when you're a child, you de your mind is developing, right? How you handle life and life situations that are throwing at you, you're developing those coping skills as you're growing up. And it sounds like you had a pretty rough childhood with your mother passing away. Um, do you remember what that was like and how that affected you as an eight-year-old kid? Mine is uh, a really bad story. My mom had cancer 
uh, breast cancer. Me and her, I don't have it with me, but me and her used to do needle point together while she was in the hospital bed. And I left one little piece that's not done yet. I've got it framed, everything else. But while it's in her arms, she died. I went and told my dad, Mom's going to sleep. Dad goes running in there and she died while he's in her arms. But what it really affected me so bad, I lost all my memory, everything. The only thing I could remember to do was go to the bathroom, eat, and sleep. I ended up going to the University of Victoria and Commotion College almost every single day with therapists and everything trying to bring me back. I ended up, uh, because of the failing grade three, I had to redo it. But it was, I was put into a big experiment. There was lots of papers written about me back then because in the one room that you were working with me was another great big glass wall that they had three seats in there. I was becoming a training for emotions physiotherapist. For emotional and physiotherapist? Okay. Yeah. So you were, you were you were a case study with the uh-huh. with the depression that, that came on to you after your mother passed, basically. Yeah. Uh this is the first time I was told that publicly. Oh wow. Wow. I, I can't imagine what um, that would be like. I'm an open book now. I don't care what questions people ask. Mm. I am going to prove I'm an open book and it helps people trust me. Well, yeah, absolutely. It does help people. And and you exposing this uh, about your childhood is, is a big thing because there's plenty of other people out there that have lost parents at a young age and had to go through their own coping mechanisms and their own coping skills at that time with what they had. You were going through your coping skills, your treatments with what you had. Now, it sounds like your father would put you into this therapy or into this treatment. And he obviously noticed a change about you. When did you start realizing or when did you start normalizing again or coming back to somewhat normal? Do you remember that? About a year later. About a year later. So you're about nine or 10 years old when everything started coming back about to normal again? Nine. Okay. About nine. Growing up through that in school, can you recall any type of way that experience changed you? At times, it would, uh, I'd lashed out being kind of a bully. At times, I just wanted to climb up and be by myself. It kind of went wishy-washy both ways between good and bad and regret. Regret was a big part of it for me. Regret? Why regret? Regret because I'd be a bully to someone. Regret because I climbed up. Uh, regret because I didn't talk openly back then. There's all kinds of different things that made it feel regretful. Okay. When did you start noticing that pattern as you were growing up? About 12, 13 years old. About 12 or 13 years old. When would let me ask you this? When would you say that your life kind of went back on plane, kind of like a normal plane where things were just okay and you were just out living your life and you weren't worried about these things uh, that affected you because of your mother's passing? Probably uh, eighteen years old when I left home. Eighteen years old when you left home. Why? Why? Why did it take so? Why do you think it took so long? for you to overcome that. I mean, that's 10 years later after your mother passed. Part of it is because I couldn't really totally be myself because I was brought up in an upper class family where you weren't allowed to talk unless if you were talked to. Your grades had to be perfect. There was so much pressure put on you all the time. Do you find that growing up in that kind of atmosphere was a bit detrimental 
for you as a kid growing up? Yes and no. It's, every, this is a big thing. Everything that's happened in my life, I will never, ever, ever, ever change because it's made me who I am now. So it wasn't detrimental to me. Was it hard? Yes. So this is, this is for me, it's, it's a little bit hard to understand. I did not grow up as a privileged child at all. And, you know, growing up, we always made fun of the privileged kids because it was like, oh, they're having such a bad day and their Mercedes Benz and getting to go eat ice cream every day after school and daddy's mommy's money. And, you know, oh, they're never broke. And, you know, I was that I was part of those kids that that grew up in a little bit of a uh, lower middle class. And when I hear somebody that says, well, I had a privileged childhood, I would, I grew up in the 1%, but life was difficult. I don't want to take that away because your issues are your issues. My issues are my issues. And just, we live two different lives. And I cannot say that your life was any less more difficult or more difficult than mine and you and vice versa, right? Because we were just living two different lives. So it's interesting to me to hear that. And and I kind of want to know what part of it, of that lifestyle would make it difficult for you because for someone like me, I mean, sh- that that's, that's a dream to grow up in that kind of privilege and that kind of home. Yes. You know, I wasn't in the white percent. I was just, we were just below that. Like, no, we we didn't get everything we wanted. We still kind of had to work for it. We were still raised with, because uh, I'm a baby boomer, I still raised with the values of you have to work for things. We didn't get an allowance, not at all. You never got an allowance. Okay? No, we didn't get an allowance. Ours was, you worked out in the yard? Oh, you want to go to a rock concert? Here's the money. You want to go skating? Here's the money. Oh, you need gas for your car? Here's the money. But we weren't given free reign of all the money. Right. But it wasn't also an issue for them to provide that for you if you did your chores around the house or anything like that. If we didn't do it, my parents would say, no, you didn't do it. You didn't go out work. You didn't do your chores. You didn't do this. So no, you said nothing. It was a learning lesson. Right. So they use that as a learning lesson, but they weren't ever, it wasn't ever, no, we can't do it because we can't afford it. It was no, we, you're not getting it because you didn't do the work. Never. Okay. See, so that's different than me. For me, a lot of the times when I was growing up, it was, we'd love to, but we can't afford it. Or I know you've been working hard but I'm sorry, we can't do this for you because we don't have the money. So for me, it's just a little bit different. Right. And Uh I'm wondering, I'm wondering what part of that life made it difficult for you? What part of growing up, as you said, somewhat privileged, what part of that lifestyle made it a little bit difficult? Basically kind of the way it was for me that I looked at it was uh, you couldn't really be a kid around other people. You, you had to be a grown up and just sit there and be quiet. You had to be prim and proper. You could never really be a kid. No, but when we went camping, we could or things like that. We still did that. But this is around most of our other family, right? Mm hmm. It sounds like you had very, very structured times of when you had to be prim and proper or when you were okay to be a kid and having, very to, much so. having to keep up with those social cues. Yeah. I can see that as being anxiety. Like my anxiety, is this okay for me to act this way? Is this time okay for me to be a kid? Oh, wait, no, I got the look from dad. I better not. And I can only imagine what that was like. It's weird for me that you know, hearing that, because for me, I was always a kid. I never had to, I mean, yes, I had my, my, I minded my P's and Q's. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. But it was Mm -hmm. never, it was never, if we were in any situation that I had to sit down, be quiet, unless we were in church, of course, but like, 
it was, you know, you're a kid. I was a kid. I, I don't remember ever having to be told to sit up right um, or anything like that. It was just, you're a kid. I'm a kid. But it sounds like with you, you had you had to deal with that a little bit. Here's one example. If you really acted up, this is probably when I was uh, nine years old. Back then, spanking, the strap, everything else was still good me out. Well, I acted up at my grandparents, and a lot of the family was over there. My dad took me by the hand and said, come with me. He took me outside, took his belt off, gave me a spanking, with the belt outside, he said, you better behave. Don't come in until all your tears are gone, you're wiped away. And she walked back inside. So your dad was into corporal punishment? Not really. Not really. I probably got uh, 10 spankings out of my whole life. Wow. I wish I only had 10 spankings out of my whole life. <laughs> I got yeah, spanked. So, I got spanked a lot. <laughs> but she, uh, I was when I was in school. The strap was still in school. Mm. So when you got sent to the office, if it was bad, oh yeah, you got the strap. You got the strap. Have you ever? Did you ever get the strap in school? Oh yeah, quite a few times. Quite a few times. Were you like a class clown, or were you? Was it because of that bullying that you were talking about, or? Part of both class clown, bit of a bully. Bit of a bully. When when you're growing up and you're, you're going through high school and you get to about 18, you said that's where you started living life and not allowing what happened with your mother to affect you as much. So you're 18 years old. Um, what were your plans going forward? I was trying to get uh, play soccer professionally for the Vancouver Whitecaps. I actually played on the reserve team, uh, but then my knee got taken out. That ended my career. So that is kind of in limbo. I'm sorry, what got and kicked out? What what happened? My knee. Oh, my your knee. knee got taken out. And I have carbon fiber ligaments in there now. Oh, and wow. two artificial ligaments. Two pins, two carbon fiber ligaments. Did that happen when you were playing? Mm -hmm. Wow. So you're playing soccer, you're trying to go pro and somebody takes your knee out and that's it, huh? It was, it happens. I don't hold it against the guy. I don't hold it against anybody. Right. Actually, it's happened. Right. What did that do to your psyche though? I mean, here you are, you're 18 years old, you're a young kid, you're, you're trying to make it professionally. Started drinking heavy. You started drinking heavy. Why do you think you, you resorted to that? I don't know. I not really haven't figured it out. You haven't figured it out. Well, I mean, you hear the, you hear yeah. the, I'm sorry, go ahead. I haven't totally figured that way out. I'm still trying to because I quit on my own. I uh, ended up, I didn't have to, I ended up being an alcoholic because of it. And I ended up quitting my own. I didn't go through rehab. Well, that's, that's I was able good. To play on my own. That's awesome. But I, I'm still, I'm still, I'm, you know, when you ask that question, you know, why do you think you resorted to alcohol after that, something like that happens? Well, a lot of people, the excuses, when I was trying to numb the pain, um, I was upset with myself and this was the only thing that got my mind off of it and so forth, so on and so forth. Those are like the normal excuses. Do you think, any of those excuses kind of fell into why maybe you got into it? They do. They do, because it was a deep depression. I was mad. I was upset. I was angry. All because I spent years and years and years doing nothing but soccer. And that's what I want to do. It all sends it over. So I guess it was kind of really numbing the pain. But I just Kind of made me in a happy place to forget about it. You think it put you in a little bit of a happier place to forget about it? Now, do you think? Do you think For it was? A while. Do you think forgetting was making you happier, or was it? How do I say this? Or was it the high from the alcohol, the drunk feeling? 
getting away from the feeling, stopping thinking about it for a bit, was the biggest thing. But it had too many side effects. I was depressed. I could, I, I think this works, but it ended up just putting me way down worse in the dumps where I couldn't get out. And it's just like, no, I got to quit. You can't substitute one pain for another. And that's where I learned it myself. That's learned where you learned it. it. You can't substitute. You can't wash away pain. You can't use pills or drugs to get away from pain because it's still there. I learned I just had to face it head on and move on. Now you're going through this. You're, you, you're using alcohol and everything. And when did you decide like that was enough? How long of a stint do you think that was? Five years. About five I got years. To the point, I got to the point. I'd wake up, grab the mixie beside the bed, drink half of it, and then go to work. And what were you doing for work at that time, if you don't mind me asking? At that time, I was working for a roofing company doing sheet metal on okay. a roof. So roofing company doing sheet metal roofing, and you'd go to work a little tipsy. Oh, yeah, hello. But when you drink that much all the time, it's a functioning alcoholic. Wow. Most people can't tell. That yeah. Uh, well, I'm I'm happy you got out of it. And you know, it's it's a common story when somebody goes through a hard time through a loss. And what you went through was was I would consider it a loss. You you lost the the chase of your dream, right? Like you lost it. It's gone. And that kind of loss can lead people into depression and into substance use. Um, and you, at some point you found a way out of it, which is good. I am happy you did. Um, how did you find yourself out coming out of that? I noticed I lost all my friends. I had to get new ones. The biggest thing is, oh my God, I really did this to myself. What the heck was I doing? I could have destroyed my life. I could have killed myself. There's all kinds of things going through my head like that at the time. And one of the things that really sealed the deal with that, I'm making my mind never to go back and how bad it was. I started playing lots of darts. And we were going to different bars. We finally went to, had to go play a game in the uh, bar I used to go to. There was four guys sitting at the bar. Hey, Al, how's it going? Haven't seen you since yesterday. Why don't you sit down and have a drink? I mean, three years. They were still sitting at the bar drinking every day. Oh, wow. I was like, oh, my God. You think it's only been one day and it's been three years? Yeah, alcohol really changes your brain the way you think. And that was a big, I'm never, ever going back. Can I have a drink every now and then? Yes, I can now, but I couldn't for years. Well, that's good. You you found you found your your self uh awareness and your self restraint when it comes to using alcohol, which is good. And I I don't have anything against people who use vices, be it smoking, alcohol. Look, it's your body, it's your choice, and you get to put whatever you want in it, however you want in it. However, when it becomes detrimental to yourself or to others, that's when it becomes an issue. And that's when, you know, you really need to take a step back and realize what you can or cannot do to change this. And it sounds like you've had a, a really good go at it. And I'm happy that you have found that self-restraint and that you have been sober um, from that you were sober for that period of time to get to the point that you needed to, to let your mind strengthen and your will strengthen because not a lot of us, um, are patient enough for that to happen. No. All right. Not a lot of us are very, are, are patient enough to, to wait or to learn or to evaluate ourselves like that. Uh, especially when we feel like, no, this is helping now. So I'm going to do it now. So I, I am very, very, very proud of you for that. 
Um, I want to move into when is it that you decided to get into uh, the civil service? You said earlier that you were an EMT for a while. Mm-hmm. When, yeah, when was, was that? Part time. I wanted to go full time, but living in Victoria, D.C., it would take almost seven years to 10 years to get on full time. Otherwise, you're part time on call. So, my best friend in high school, his brother was the president of the EMT Ambulance Association. And my best friend wanted to do it too. He also got into firefighting. He was the chief of Malahat Fire Department. But we were really, really good friends. But I just couldn't live off, you know, one, two days a week work. I couldn't. Had to take on another job. And it's just like, oh, got a job for you tomorrow. I can't. I got a full time job now. I can only do night shift. Oh. Our night shift is completely booked. It's like, oh. How old so, are you? And I just walked away uh, in my 20s. In your 20s? So you were fairly young going through the EMS, you know, being an EMT and everything. Uh, it's cool hearing the stories from, you know, our northern friends, our Canadians and everything about how that system works and everything. And I know this is a little bit off subject, but this is more for my uh curiosity than anything else how did it work up there for you to get your emt like did you did they just hire you and put you through school or did you have to go to school do yourself i had to go take my back then when i did it was industrial first aid is what it was called you had to go take your course and you get a grade level each time you took it first time you get a c level which means your license is only good for one year. Then you can get a B. Then you can get an A or double A. The double A was every five years, but you had to be working as in, in the industry as an EMT. But it's changed a lot over the years. Oh, uh, I'm sure it has. I'm sure it's changed quite a bit. Uh, during that time as an EMT, do you remember... Um, how did that affect you? Do you remember how it affected you? Uh, the calls that you went on and, and things that you may have seen? No, they didn't affect me because prior to doing that, I was doing accident investigation cleanups. Mm-hmm. That affected me quite a bit. Accident investigation cleanup. So that affected you more than, than being an EMT. Well, because you have all the people that were either shot or uh, suicide or there's all those different ones where I had to go clean it up. What got you into that line of work? Money. The motivator for most of us. Most <laughs> Yeah, the motivator for most it of really us. Was. Money. And, and, I, you know, coming into this field, for anybody that's coming into the EMS field, the fire, the civil service field in general, if you think you're going to get rich becoming a firefighter an EMT or a cop Uh -uh. or a military personnel, it ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. Uh, Be prepared to have work a lot of overtime and, or have a second job be and, or go find yourself a sugar mama or sugar daddy. Cause I I promise you, you're not going to get rich doing this job. But I'll tell you what, because of that, because these individuals know that they're not going to get rich doing this job, you know, they're doing the job because they love the job and they take pride in doing the job. So just keep that in mind. The next time you see a civil service member, they are doing it because they love the job and they like, they love helping people in the capacity that they do that job in. I want to, push it forward a little bit. There was a time where your mental health started declining. And I'm kind of, I want to get the backstory first before we go into that as to, I mean, you've already been through a mental health crisis when you were a kid, 
with your mother passing, going through therapy, being a case study, Mm -hmm. um, 18 years old, you're going through depression because your knee gets knocked out. You're trying to become a professional uh, soccer player. Your knee gets bumped out and you fall into a little bit of alcoholism. I'm not going to say a little bit, you fall into alcoholism. Um, and then you find Mm -hmm. yourself out of it and then, you know, you're living your life, um, at what point did this life of yours, because it sounds like you've had a pretty rough life, right? You've had good times, bad times. Uh, your childhood was a little iffy because you couldn't really be a kid at times. And then you could, uh, you were privileged, but you didn't feel so much as privileged sometimes. And now here you are, you're, you're growing up, you're getting older. Uh, you, you break a habit of alcoholism. Um what were you doing and, and how was life treating you as you were moving forward? I ended up uh, me getting married. Having ch- well, we had kids and then I got married. The kids were the ones that kept me going. My wife was very abusive to me, very abusive. And I don't want to get into it because I don't want to call her out. But dislocated shoulder, dislocated elbow, uh, diffusion just in my back, puppy cups all smashed over my head. And the reason why I don't want to get into it, I never say their names. Because I'm a big believer in this part. I loved her at one point. Just because I fell out of love doesn't mean I need to bash her. It doesn't mean I have to put her down. Doesn't mean I have to tell dirty little secrets about her. I don't have to try to get revenge. It's over, right? So it's over. We both went our own ways. Right. But I left that after 19 years. I just had enough. Found out she was sleeping with my best friend in Victoria. That was it. I'm done. Walked away, you know, the boy, everything else. And uh, then I ended up meeting another girl. And that other girl was wanting to be a pro dom. And I've been in the BGSM world for years. And I mean years. I taught quite a few different pro doms how to do all kinds of scenarios. I won't get dirty on here. No, no, no. I, I actually, I, I actually want to stop you just for a quick second, if you don't mind. Uh, this is amazing. I, I, so the, the lifestyles when it comes to um, sex, because it's a sex lifestyle. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm all for talking about those lifestyles. I, it doesn't bother me at all. I'm very open and honest with, with mine as well. But BDSM and Dom and stuff, and you, you just kind of drop the bomb nonchalantly right oh i met this girl and she wanted to be a pro dom blah 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 and then you just went on like it was nothing which is awesome which tells me that you do not look at anybody's uh situation when it comes to that in any type of uh, judgmental form right which is awesome i love it i just wanted to let you know i love it it's it's great that i meet somebody that can be open and honest with that kind of stuff because Everybody has the things that please them, right? Sometimes it's 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 with a lifestyle. Sometimes it's just a sport. Sometimes it's a hobby. But if a lifestyle makes you happy and if a lifestyle doesn't harm anyone else, then there should be no shame in talking about it and being open with it, Right. So I just want to mm-hmm. let you know, I want to let you know, you can take as long as you want. Don't worry about it. it. I'm not, I'm not in any way, shape or form embarrassed and, or like taboo about it in any way, shape or form. Cause believe it or not, um, I've dabbled a little bit into it myself. See, yeah, I just mean by saying that I'm not going to go into details. I'll make it 18 plus. I'll <laughs> keep it. <laughs> no, no, this, this, this show is 18 plus. This show is not made for children. When it gets posted, it's not made for children. So and that's just who I am because okay. I, as you know, we met in TikTok 
Yes, sir. And I help everybody. I don't care about your age because a six-year-old needs as much help as a 59-year-old male. I got you. I got you. And well, that's I'm just how I think. Well, I'm just letting you know, whatever you want to say, it's okay. So you're, you're, you have but free reign here. To get into it, uh, we ended up, she wanted a lot more. So, okay, fine. And Angie got into it a lot more. I taught her all kinds of different stuff. She wanted me to teach all the different things from CBT, uh, hooks, suspension, Wax, fire play, like all of it, including how you use the code property teacher, all of it, how you use a flogger, right? How you use house, right? So I had to teach her the right way, how to read the body, everything else. Well, she wanted to get into it professionally. So I built her a dungeon, completely outfitted the whole thing for her. Uh, it was a big room. Like a doctor's table, a bag, uh, St. Andrew's, cost docs, a uh, device for CBGs, all the toys, all the different size strap lines for, depends on what the client's wanting. And she had a website, she charged per hour. There's not sex in it, so it's legal. Most people don't realize it. That is legal in Canada. Bondage and discipline is all legal in Canada, as long as you don't have sex with them. But strap on isn't having sex because it's not two bodies. But anyways, she wanted to be a total control over me. So we did up a true slavery contract. I was in love. I loved her unconditionally. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, this is all leading up to why I ended up taking my life. But ended up going along and we're doing it all, everything else. All of a sudden, ah, I need to start speaking with other guys, not you. Huh? She needs to start speaking with other her. guys. So I love her unconditionally. I said, yeah, okay. Because I loved her unconditionally. And no one should ever, ever do that. So she ends up coming home. I slept with this guy. I slept with that guy. Blah, blah, blah. He's like, are you going to break up with me? Well, I loved her unconditionally, so I didn't. Then it changed to, oh, I'm going to take on boyfriends. Meanwhile, I'm making $120,000 to $200,000 a year back then. Oh, wow. I was making some good money. So I paid for the house. I paid for all the groceries, everything else. Well, she decided, well, I want the ultimate gift you can give a dominatrix. I'm sorry, I say that again. I'm sorry, say that again. She I, also wanted to what? She wanted the ultimate gift given to a dominatrix, a mistress. Uh-huh. Trying to debate everything else, went over the signed contract, and yeah, she was alive. So she started destroying my testicles completely. Oh, wow. Including injections. Is it half my fault? Yes, because I agreed to it. She kept telling me she'd never leave, blah, blah, blah. I just want them gone. Okay, fine, Jamie. Well, we all went over what the side effects were, when they went and everything else. Well, he moves a boyfriend in with, with us. I'm paying the cigarettes. I'm paying for the roof over his head. I'm paying for the food. I'm also paying for gas to go in his vehicle. Huh? I say, I can't be doing this. This is enough. He needs to start paying something. So what does she do? Give her $500. Not me, I think. But anyways, uh, ended up, she ended up putting an injection into it. I have video receipts and everything else. I have videos on my laptop of all this, including the torture she did. Otherwise, I wouldn't be saying anything. Mm -hmm. But she thought 
they she kept my phone, that's where most of it was. I saw a backdrop of the hidden directories on my laptop. I ended up having to go have them both removed in the hospital. Okay, oh, fine, wow. Jangy. She so I had both of them removed. And uh, people don't realize this. When a guy has both testicles removed right now, their testosterone goes from here all the way down through. So you lose all your testosterone. It actually puts you through menopause. Menopause is instant when it's done like that. There's another term, menopause or something, but it uh, can be worse than a female going through menopause. The hot flashes, the anxiety, the cold flashes, uh, the brain fog. It's like, oh my God. Oh, I'll be here for it. She was never here. I couldn't call her, couldn't do anything. So I'm at work. She calls, texts me and says, we're done. I'm leaving you. Huh? After, Send me a text message. After and everything that's in happened. Person. Yeah. So I ended up coming home. My gun safe I picked up was ripped right on the floor. I had a small safe inside the gun safe. I had one of the big, big, really big uh, 16 gun, gun cabinets, mm -hmm. uh, Smith and Wesson, big ones. Uh, that cost about $5,000 new, that gun cabinet. Wow. But she ripped out the fourth and she was going to take it. A TV my uncle bought for me, she took. She was taking all the high gang stuff out of the house. When I came home and saw this, she was like, oh my God. Really? I didn't say anything to her because I didn't want to lose my shit on her. So I go to the bedroom to get changed. I see all the guns laid out, except for there's a couple of mine missing. My 6.5 tree board wasn't there. I had pushed, it was about an $8,000 gun. It was a compensation long range shooting gun. That's not what I paid for it, but that's what it's worth. My 300 Ultra Bag wasn't there. The way I used to relax was either go down and reload ammunition or work on my guns. So I for thought, you no, I'm not going to reload because she has access to where I am. So I grabbed my 308 that needed to work, walked into the garage, grabbed a rope, wrapped it around the doorknob, pulled it to the railing so she couldn't come into the garage. So I started working on that gun, and she tried to open the door, couldn't open the door, knocked. I didn't want to reply to her. So she decided to walk all the way around the house to come in the garage. I said, leave me alone. I want to be alone. No, I don't want to. Okay. I said, leave me, just leave me alone. Get out. No. I said, leave me alone or I'm going to fucking shoot myself. She said, go for it. So I did. But she went along and told the police that I threatened to kill her. Please didn't believe it. But she took out, because it's easy to get restrained. She took out a restraining order against me. Fine, thank you. I'm in the hospital. I was unconscious in the hospital in a medical coma for eight months. And she said, I called her. I did this. I did that. All these things. Well, I'm in a medical coma in ICU. So she got another restraining order against me. That basically brings up on uh, what was all done to me. Do I talk to her? No. Am I ever going to say any of her secrets or say who she is? No. Because at one point, we were in love. And I said that before. I asked who I am. Now, I... <sighs> Wow. A story. I know. What a story. Ah, uh, wow. I can't. 
I, I do have questions and I do have. Go uh, for it. So my, my first question is, when were you in this lifestyle? Was it always there or when did you start getting into that lifestyle, the BDSM lifestyle? I should. <laughs> I'll go. I'll go over the story really or was this, like or was this one of the reasons, that. or was this one of the reasons why you were the black sheep? No. Oh. Okay. No. Uh, being a young kid, about twenty years old, uh, I went to go pick up this girl in the bar. Black leather corset, black skirt, high heels, dressed to the eyes, and I was hitting on her like she wouldn't believe. She goes. <laughs> You won't do what I want. You're, you, there's no way. She basically was daring me, egging me on. I didn't know who it was at the time. It was Mistress Nova Jane from New York City in Victoria, B.C. So I went to her place because she tried saying, you won't do this, you won't do as you're told, blah, blah, and then, well, I'm a young kid. I'm going to prove you wrong. Well, I ended up living with her for over a year, and she taught me an awful lot. What, so it and was, that's how I got into it. So it was a, a total happenstance. It was some beautiful, hot woman at the bar. Oh, Here, yeah. Here's this beautiful, hot woman at the bar. She's telling you, nah, you're not going to do as I tell you, nah. And so you being a young man going, no one's going to tell me what I can and cannot do. I'm going to prove her wrong. Shit, watch mm -hmm. me watch me do what you tell me to do, which sounds weird, but that was that was the the thinking, right? You're like, you're not gonna tell me what I what I am or am not gonna do. I'm gonna show you that I am gonna do it. And then all of a sudden you're living with her for a year. And this is a professional dominatrix, by the way, everybody. If you don't know who she is, go look her up, Google her name. Um, and you're living with her for a year, and she's teaching you everything. And that's how you got and into the lifestyle? Me. And using me with clients, without clients, everything else. I ended up becoming a slave. If you, if you Google Mistress Nova King, there's about 50 of them out there now. But this is the original that did all kinds of articles, everything else, in the BDSM books and everything else. She moved back to New York. But that's basically how I got into it. And okay. I just kept elaborating. I've been on Fat Life. I've done uh, courses. Uh, there's all kinds of different things. Courses, classes, training over the years. What? Okay. So now that we got the how you got into it established, the contract, which which blows my mind that you would even have to write a contract with the person you're in a relationship with. Um it shows you how much I know about the lifestyle because I'm not entirely uh, uh, familiar with it, but there's a contract written between you and this girl that you got with. Mm -hmm. Were there any clauses in that contract where if you felt like your life was in danger that you can just back out? Couldn't be life threatening. Couldn't be body altering unless previously discussed and agreed upon. All those subjects were covered. It was a 12 page contract. Okay, so here, here's my question. Here's this woman that wants to mutilate your testicles, right? And you look over the contract and she says, no, you have to. And you, you agree to it because it's in the contract. I, me, just thinking i'd be like you know what this is too much i'm just going to say no what is she going to do sue me now what what would happen if you just decided to say you know what no that's too much for me i'm i'm not going to do that i could have said no but i loved unconditionally i knew i could have said no it was it was worthy of contract where i could say no to any of it it had to be discussed and agreed upon before anything like that happened and i agreed to it so it's half my fault i and i i respect the fact that you take you know you you take your part in it and, and you 
you you take responsibility for that. I, I respect that fact. But how what I guess what I'm not getting is at some point, it sounds to me like there there could have been a stop this moment. But mm-hmm. you had this love for her, which and you keep saying it, I loved her unconditionally, 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 unconditionally. I think that that term is how do I say this? It's not defined as well as it should be. Right. I think the term unconditionally means I accept you for who you are. And I accept you for your flaws. I accept you for your, your, your successes. But at the same time to me, that also doesn't mean that I'm going to allow you to become a toxic person in my life. That's where it's not unconditionally. Most people will not ever love unconditionally. I did and allowed it. I allowed the toxicity and everything else. That's why it is unconditional. And that makes sense. That makes sense. You, your love for her was unconditional that you allowed the toxicity, you allowed the abuse, yes. you you allowed the the basically neglect that she showed towards you, um, the taking advantage of, it it just blows my mind. And I guess I'm wondering where this mindset of unconditional to you came from. Why your own head, you just came up with it and decided. I, I loved you that much. I do it unconditionally. So I did. Will I ever do that again? Uh-oh. No. Oh, hell no. <laughs> hell no. We all learn from our mistakes. And right. that was a big one. Now, you know, you're going through all this and, and, and she's, she's obviously taking advantage of you. She's abusing you. She's neglecting your oh. feelings and everything else. That day that you ended up, you know, shooting yourself. Were you intending on taking your own life? No. Even up to the point where you did shoot yourself? No. Uh, it just clicked all of a sudden, just like that. You know, uh, I may have thought a little bit of uh, my life's over. I was lying to it, you know, but I didn't really think of changing my life. Because 99% of the people out there in this world have always thought of taking their life at some point. Right. Everybody's had a suicidal ideation. There's a difference between, uh, and uh, this is a good point here. There's a difference between suicide attempt, suicide ideation. Um, the suicide ideation is just thinking about what it would be like if you committed suicide, if you died, right? And if you took your own life. That's a that's an idea. That's why it's called ideation. It's an idea. And then, mm-hmm. of course, there's suicide attempts where you actually attempt to take your life. You it's, it's, it's kind of hard. It's weird, right? Because you're in this high stress moment with her and you're, you're tolling, you're telling her leave, or I'm going to shoot myself. Now, when you tell her that, is that a leave or I'm going to kill myself or is that leave where I'm going to hurt myself? In my mind to myself. Cause kill it yourself. was over. I had the gun there. I dropped the clip in it with three rounds. That's my magic number. All my clips and all my rifles, only, I only put three rounds in it. That's so, my magic remember number. That's why I know it was three rounds. So in this high stress moment and all this is going on, you pull the trigger. Do you remember pulling the trigger? Mm-hmm. Now there's studies out there that show that about, I think it was like a very high percentage of suicide survivors that as soon as the attempt was made, they regretted the decision almost immediately. Do you remember that? Okay. I, I will talk about your part, but there's a reason why I don't like to. 
because of the people I think they about doing suicide. After I pulled the trigger, there was no pain, no thoughts, no nothing. And that's why I don't like to say anything. Well, because it, there's all kinds of people that are going to try. And no, if you use your gun, there's no pain. That's not necessarily true. I mean, you lived. You had to go through a world of pain and recovery. After, but After. not in that instance, not when that trigger was pulled. Right. If I didn't make it, there would be no pain. That's why I don't like to talk about that part. Let me of ask it. you something. But Let me I'm ask you something. Honest. You that, I, and that's a good thing. Let me ask you something. You say there's no pain, there was no memories, there's nothing. Was it just nothing? While I was in the uh, ICU afterwards, when uh, it was done, I remember hearing uh, her scream, oh, my God, no. Uh, and then I remember the police saying, is the gun loaded? Other than that, I don't remember anything being told to me or talked to me until I came conscious again. But it took like a week for the fog to go away. Did I have dreams while I was there? I think so, but I'm not absolutely sure. But really, while you're there at the different times, you don't have any emotions. You know when you have a dream, there's emotions which you dream, everything else? There was none. There was none. There was no emotion, no real feeling. It wasn't like an empty dream. So that's interesting, right? Because when a lot of the times, a lot of us who, and I say a lot of us, because I, I have had suicidal ideations. Um, I did try to pull a trigger on my, on myself. Um, so a lot of us who have these ideations and, and failed attempts or, um, you know, successful attempts that you happen to survive. And that's what I would call yours. Yours was a successful attempt that you survived. I, I don't think once you decide to make it happen, the outcome that you're looking for doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. And what I mean by that oh, is man. what I mean by that is usually we want the pain to stop. We want to feel better. We want to be happy again, right? We want to feel okay again. Well, you don't feel anything. You, you, you take that pain with you. You that the pain won basically. The last thing you remember is the pain. That's the last thing you remember is the pain before it happened. You don't get what you wanted. Mm -hmm. You don't get the before. feeling okay. Yeah. You don't you don't get any of that. And if there are people out there that are contemplating, first of all, call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, 1 800 273 8255 But for anybody out there that are listening to the story, he's being honest, but you got to remember he felt nothing. It was completely blank and he hardly remembers anything. And it was like no feelings, no nothing. Mind you, he was in a coma for eight months. He probably doesn't remember anything because he knocked himself out. Oh, I lost a few brain IQs after that gunshot. It didn't go through my brain but the adults and everything else, because I already had 13 other head concussions, it caused more damage. But the real struggle and the mind, everything going through my head was after I woke up. After about a week of coming off, being unconscious for so long, coming off and being in pain meds. They put me on certain psych meds. It's like, God, get me off these. I'm not on any now. I said, no, I don't want them. Take me off them. How mm -hmm. do I get myself off them? I don't have a phone to Google how I can take myself off and slowly. But there was a lot of different emotions, a lot of different thoughts. You know, okay, I survived. What now? Why did I survive? Why didn't I die? Am I mad? Am I not? You know, there's so much going through my eyes' head. That's like, okay, my higher power let me live. I don't know why, but he did. Let's get on with his life. 
it, you know, and that's, that's something that I did want to dive into a little bit with you. You did survive this suicide attempt. You, you survived it, mm-hmm. you know, coming out of that. Did you feel that it, there's, I have so many questions about it. Did you feel defeated and that you didn't even, you, you didn't even accomplish the attempt? Did you feel like, well, shit, I need to do this again. Did you feel like, oh, it sounds like you're like, well, I was given another chance at life. Let me make the most of it. it sounds like that's the, 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 the route you ended up taking. But during that time of reflection, what, what did that time of reflection feel like and look like for you? Because that, that's something that, that is very intriguing to me. She, while I was laying in the hospital bed, six and eight, because I spent two and a half more months in the hospital after I came conscious. But why didn't I die? Why? I kept asking why in my mind, and I couldn't get an answer. To this day, I do not know or understand why I'm so alive. I can't figure it out at all. I don't have that answer. I can't get that answer no matter how much I've thought about it. I thought about it this way, that way, inside, outside, down, every different way. The only thing I can think of that helped me is my God turns around and says, I'm not done with you. I have a mission for you. And that's probably the only answer I got out of asking that question. Why am I alive? How long did it come for you? How long did it take for you to come to that conclusion that you just felt like God just wasn't done with you yet and that he has a mission for you? Probably just before I got out of the hospital when it really clicked in. But it didn't majorly, majorly. Well, it had really clicked in, but. I just hadn't said anything publicly, but I still had, uh, when I got out of the hospital, I had my church help me a fair bit. They even helped with food, spirituality, talking. I still talk to the person that came and helped me all the time. Do you attribute your faith to your healing from this? Hmm. Not really. Not Not my healing. Not your healing. So what 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 would you attribute your healing to? And and not just not just the physical healing, the 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 mental health aspect of it as well. Most of that is all had to come from the inside. Did I have questions? Most of it was my thinking, the way I thought, the type of person I am. And that's basically how I come up with always. You know how I preach about good karma. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's kind of really, I have to be good to get good. I have to be nice to get nice. If I put out evil, I'll get evil. And it's just like, that really, really helped me. Did I I keep going through the Lord's Prayer, the Scripture, the Bible? Yes, but that wasn't the key things. Lots of things really helped me in figuring it out myself, from talking to him, talking to other friends, close friends that became afterwards. Because I was in the hospital for 10 months and had one visitor. So these are close friends that, that became close friends after the attempt. Yeah. Do you believe that Sometimes it takes that kind of of event to happen for true people to actually show themselves in your life. It showed a lot of true people. It really did. Here's one thing I'm going to say. Guys, if you feel depressed or whatever else, you have to reach out. If you're going to reach out to friends, don't reach out to one. Reach out to 10 to 20 of your friends. If you click or don't click. Because that time where you got to pick up the phone 
and call somebody because you're feeling suicidal. Oh, I'm at work. I can't talk. Oh, I'm busy with your kids. Oh, not right now. There's so many people that will say, you should have called. You should, I'll be there for you no matter what. They won't. They can't because life gets in the way. That's why you need quite a few of them that you can reach out. And I'm talking from experience. That's actually a very good point. That is a very good point. A lot of the times we as friends to individuals always tell our friends, if you ever need anything, call me, I'll be there. But we forget to take into account that we also have our own lives as well. We cannot always be available. We would like to think we will be, but we can't. Life happens. And it's okay that life happens. You shouldn't blame yourself if something happens that, you know, your friend called and then all of a sudden you found out a tragedy happened. You can't blame yourself. You can't say, well, had I only picked up the phone, I had I only done this. The thing is, is that no. you also have your life as well. And you make an, a very important point that if you find yourself needing help, don't call just one person. That one person still has a life of their own and they have their struggles of their own. They have their responsibilities of their own. And you cannot expect, it's actually unfair to expect anyone in your life to drop everything just for you, especially if they're not aware of what's going on right then and there. If you call them and they don't pick up, they might be busy, just like any other day where they might be busy, just like a day where you weren't feeling like you needed help. They might have been busy. So Al's point in calling 10 to 20, even if they're just acquaintances, call. Keep calling until you get somebody that is going to listen to you, that is going to hear you. That is a great, 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 great example, Al. And I thank you for bringing that up because I don't believe that that gets thrown out there enough, especially for, no. uh, especially for the, the acquaintances and friends and family of those that we have lost to suicide. We, we put a lot of a blame on ourselves. We put a lot of uh, a pain on ourselves for not answering that phone call or for not getting back to that text fast enough or for not going and spending that night out with them because we were busy with school or work or family. We have to remember that we have our own lives as well. And yes, we can do our best to be there for those individuals that feel like they need us there. But at the same time, they have a responsibility upon themselves to know that they cannot be the center of everyone's life all the time. So, Al, thank you for bringing that point up. See, I'm the type of person now and going through all that, and my phone goes off at 3 30 in the morning. I answer, I talk to them. If I'm out helping friends, Somebody really, really needs to talk. I stop and talk to him because I'm being in that place. Because you've been in that place. It really does suck. It sucks. So I need to. And there's a reason why I need to. I think I don't care how many. Friends and family I have, because that's why I call my followers on TikTok. I don't care about that. I care about two numbers. One really hurts, the other one I'm proud of. I hit number 50 this year alone with people saying I saved their life. I stopped, you stopped me from taking my life. Okay? That's just the ones that told me that I keep. Talk them, but your summer really hurts. And why I took a break from TikTok for the wall. I was talking to somebody, helping him as much as I could, but he still took his life. 
I like her. She had great to me. That's the hard one. Those are the hardest numbers. I hear you on that. Trust me. I hear you. And I think those are two numbers that both need as much respect as the other. I don't think one's more important than the other. At the same time, you have to realize you did, and you said it, I helped them as much as I could. Mm-hmm. You did what you I'm could. I'm no professional. No, you're not a professional. I'm talking from real life situations to people. So I, I always make it all the time. Because people go, oh, you're not professional. No, I'm talking from real life situations, what I'm going through. So what I always tell people is like, I'm not a mental health expert, but I am an expert on sharing the stories of what I've been through and what I've learned. I am mm-hmm. an expert at sharing those stories. I'm not a mental health expert, but I'm an, I'm an expert at sharing my experience and what I've learned through research and reading and talking to people and, and just learning. I, I will regurgitate and teach you everything that I have learned and everything that I have been through. And that's what you're doing. And I truly believe that beyond therapy, because I think therapy is the absolute number one way to go. Next in line is hearing stories and talking to people that have been there, talking to people that have experience. I think that's the next best thing in your path to mental health clarity and, and healthiness is listening to these stories and listening to how they came about, how they found their way out of it, what they did to get themselves out of it. Those stories help in your journey. Had I been talking to those type of people and heard those stories before my attempt, I probably wouldn't have gone as far as I did. But at the same time, I also needed therapy. Like, no joke, I needed therapy. But it's just nothing to be ashamed about. Absolutely. It's not it, it's not anything you should be ashamed about. Not at all. Yeah, you know, I had a previous guest on, he goes, whether you're going through something or not, I think like we always go for for physical checkups all the time. All the time, either for work or for sports or whatever the case may be. We have physical checkups all the time. Why don't we have mental health checkups? Why is why? It costs money. Yeah, well, so do physical health checkups. Physical health checkups cost money. I, I just, there should be a, it shouldn't be so taboo to say, you know what? I feel okay. Everything feels fine, but you know what? Maybe I should go talk to the therapist just, you know, just to make sure everything's good or, you know, get a different perspective on life. Just get a good, get a little bit of a checkup. You know, there, there's nothing wrong with that. But most of those places, especially up here, are 150 to $250 an hour. Okay. Money, as simple as it is, definitely runs a lot of our decision-making abilities when it comes to that stuff. I won't deny that. I won't deny that. Okay. Now, to get in to talk to him, oh, book now. We'll get you in the next couple of months. There's not enough of them. Again, another, another hurdle to overcome. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But there are resources out there for those that are looking for immediate help. There are some resources. Uh, I said it earlier, National Suicide Prevention Hotline. Believe it or not, you don't necessarily have to be suicidal to call them. You can call them because you don't want to get to that place. And I don't think very many people are familiar with that. 
you can call them because you don't want to get to that place. So you want to talk to somebody that might be able to help. And they have resources that they can point you in a direction that will help you in your local area. They have resources that they can connect you with. I don't believe in the excuse that there is nothing there. I don't believe in that excuse. Oh, there is something there. There's always help there. I want you to say what you say. Because this has come up a lot of times. Oh, I want help, but I'm afraid to ask for help. I say, well, ask your doctor. Well, why is my doctor? I said, it makes fun of me. A doctor's not going to grab a PA phone. Hey, look, I got a crazy person in my office. Why are you getting the message? Because they want to help people. They will help you all they can. That's why they really got into medicine and the money for some. Mm -hmm. But it is to help. Yeah, absolutely. You can talk to your normal doctor and they can refer you to somebody that they might mm -hmm. know. There's referrals all the time that happen. So there's nothing wrong with talking to your even if it's your regular doctor you go to for physical checkups, you can tell them, hey, I'm having some mental health problems. Uh, is there anything that you can do for me? And they go, yep, yeah, let me, I know somebody that you can talk to. Let me write you a referral. And you can even ask them, uh, can you make sure that they take my insurance or whatever the case may be? They will work with you. They will get a case manager to work with you. I promise you. But yeah. Um, well, I'll, I, I, I want to move forward from all this. And I want to say first and foremost, thank you for being so go candid ahead. and honest with everything that you have shared. I really do appreciate it. I really do appreciate the fact of your That's candidness. I, I appreciate your, your just, yeah, candid, just being so candid about it and being nonchalant and being honest with, with your experience through all this. Um, but I want to move forward. You know, you, you get out of the hospital. One, how old were you at this time? If you don't mind me asking. 56. You were 56 and you're 59 now. So this only happened three years ago. So this is. July 19th, July 19th, 2019. So, wow. Very three years ago. Like this is, this happened very recently. Um, mm -hmm. From that time that you got out of the hospital. Now you start living your life again. What have you done or felt like you needed to do um, to become a better individual for yourself? I don't know how to answer that one, honestly. See, I've always been a fairly positive person, always have been. And it was kind of all muddled up. I didn't know what to do. I rented a room in someone else's house because I wanted to be near other people. In case I need to talk or have with my physical uh, stuff, I just do not want to be alone. I want to try to figure things out. And I kind of really latch on to different people to help me go through, help me keep my mind busy, how to not sit there and think about. All of it. I can do it in bits and pieces slowly. But having someone else there, just as a good friend, to go out grocery shopping, go for walks, do anything, didn't have my mind thinking about it all the time. So it helped. I can think in stages and slowly. So it took probably a uh, a year before I really started thinking of what I got to do. But about a year and a half after, uh, with one of my best friends, I was looking after her kids during the day. There was one guy on TikTok right here, Madman Miller 33. He did a challenge, because I just was watching videos, but he did a challenge it was called, he said, I'm going to call this your breakout challenge. Do I just this? Let me know what your most insecure thing is. So I switched it. I switched it in 
went like this, put it in my face. And it was. Oh, it took a lot to do it. But I just remember someone saying, nothing easy, or nothing coming, anything good doesn't come easy. If it comes easy, it's not worth it. And different sayings and proverbs from different people looking on there, because I was looking for all the positivity ones. He got me to come out, and it's like, oh, my God, all the hate I got at the very beginning, it was bad. But I learned, just let it go. I do not let any of the hate or trolls get to me online, because they hide behind the screen, like I'm doing right now. They won't say it to my face in public, but it will be behind the screen. And I had to manipulate my brain to know that and not lash back at them. You saying you saying the outcome from your attempt is you're ashamed of of what happened, or you were ashamed, excuse me. You were ashamed of the outcome of what happened. Uh and for everybody listening that you if you don't know Al, he actually he his face got deformed from the gunshot. So uh, he's, he's missing his nose. He's missing his lips. He has some surgeries, but he's learned to accept that part of him. I'm wondering, did you learn to accept that part of yourself as a reminder or what was the reason for you to accept this part of yourself now? It is what it is. You can't control people, places, or things. You can't control them. And so I was watching one show. I can't remember which show it was, but it's like girls that are getting plastic surgery. Oh, get nose done. Oh, now cheeks. Now I don't like my lips. I'll get my lips changed. Oh, I don't like to wait. There's always something you don't like. This is my face. It is what it is. Do I like not? Do I? Sorry. I don't like having a nose because I put glasses on, you know, say, brings in and fog up. So I really want a nose. Am I worried about my looks? No. But I do want a nose. I do want an upper jaw again. But most of it, I was really, really, really self conscious nervous, has anxiety, and is scared to put myself out on the web. But I did it. Did it slowly. Did a lot here. Did a lot there. Slowly come out. And it's really not that bad. Am I going to get hate on here? Yes. So you. So is everybody. They just have a target with my face. And I know it's most of them can be kids. Some of them, because I always believe this, hurt people hurt people. Now, I've expected that. You never know what someone's going through. So you could be just upset. You could have lost your mom, dad, got fired, got in a car accident. You never know what you're going through. So you are always in a bad mood. When you're in a bad mood, you treat other people bad. So I learned. Why? I don't care if they're mean to me. I'm not going to do it back. I will not throw gasoline on that fire. I will just walk away. If you come after me, oh, yeah, I'll defend myself. Not worried about that. But when they lash at you and you lash back, you're just setting fire, feeling the fire, and you start getting higher and higher. Yeah, I don't think anybody wins when you involve yourself or uh, engage with those type of people. I don't think anybody wins. Uh, A a part of you that comes out that you don't really like and you're just perpetuating the part of them that they put out there. So I, I always tell people if you get any type of hate, just ignore them. Ignore them, pretend like they don't even exist because as soon as you acknowledge them, you gave them what they wanted, acknowledgement. And that's that's it. It's as simple as that. 
It's as simple as that. Where do you go from here, Al? I want to try helping as many people as I can. I do all the time. Uh, it's like, just show me, I give my phone number out to anybody that needs it. You call me. Oh, why you didn't do that? Give out your phone number. You might get prank phone calls. I blocked that number. Then I'm always going to try to help people as much as I can. But yes, I will get burnt out. I'm a little bit burnt out right now. But what's keeping me going is I'm taking a vacation to San Antonio, Texas. Oh, that's right. That's right. Where I will be able to meet you in person in mm -hmm. San Antonio, October 14th and 15th, the Great Londini Meetup, benefiting Tadsaw, Train a Dog, Save a Warrior. You're going to be there for that. You're going to take a vacation. That's my vacation. I'm leaving on the 29th of September to go to Missouri for 10 days, getting down there. And then I'm not sure where I'm going after Tennessee or New Jersey or home. That is awesome. That is awesome. Uh, you said that you want to help people. Have you thought about going into counseling or starting a nonprofit or are you just going to continue being a presence on social media? A presence on social media for right now, because I don't have all the funding yet. Most people don't realize, oh, sure, I'm legally blind. I can't really go to school and learn. They want me to spend those $6,000 on glasses and they'll read it to me. I can't afford that. So I want to take other courses, yes. But I also have a little bit of brain damage. My IQs come down from 128 down. I don't know what it is down, but I know it's lower. So right now, the way you're helping people is just to continue to be a presence on social media. Has social media helped you through this healing process? Yes, quite a bit. There's all kinds of people that have helped. Uh, Darman, I'll go look at Darman's videos. He's helped me a little bit. There's other creators that are something like that that really have helped. The more I can think of it, there's a uh, seeing like even the great YG, when he's caught someone and calls them out. That's actually how, because it's doing good and helping someone. So to me, it's like, oh, okay, that's helping. And it's just, it kind of triggers the good response in me. And most of all that I've come across as seeing on the web is everybody being rude, everything else. I've always seen people say, oh, karma is being down. Well, people, you forget this good karma as well. Everybody forgets that. And that's why I came up with my brand, Good Karma. That's your brand, but, Good Karma? Uh, I don't know where I put my face. Oh, uh, you're good. Yeah. Where, where, can, where, uh, can people, where can people find... find uh, it's, uh, it's hands like this. And it says Good Karma under it. On the, it's also really big on the back. And it's got to say, always treat others the way you want to be treated. I Absolutely. I believe that 110%. Always treat others the way you want to be treated, no matter what the world or others throw at you. That is the best where, way to do it. Where can people... I live that. Where can people find... Right. Uh, where can people find these shirts and, and sweatshirts and stuff? in case they wanted uh, to get right one. Uh, the only place I have advertised is on my TikTok right now. In my link tree, go on my bio page link tree. It's your on TikTok. Uh, I have been, I got domain name, but it's way too long. People will forget. I mean, get a new domain name that's shorter that I can do it out and put it out there. I just got to register again. Okay. New one. So if you do want to go support 
Al here and you want to check out some of his merchandise, follow him on TikTok. What's your TikTok name again now? You can, the best way to find me, because I don't hide who I am, is Al Space Wright. W-R-I-G-H-T. All right. My username is the Hurtin, the underscore Hurtin, underscore Alberta. But it's easier to find me by using my real name. There you go. Either look up Al Wright, A-L Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T, or mm-hmm. the underscore Hurtin, underscore Alberta. Well, Al, um. I'm going to go ahead and wind it down. I want to say thank you again for no, I want everything. To thank you. Uh, I thank you for being the first podcast. Thank you for allowing me to be the first podcast that you have come on and to share your story. And thank you for allowing me to ask questions and, and poke and prod a little bit and to even go into your past. Uh, I truly believe that your story is going to help people. It's going to allow them to see that maybe suicide isn't the right choice. Ah, uh, but uh, I want to say thank you, but I'll say what you say first. When you commit suicide, you hurt your family, your friends, everything else. It's like dropping a rock into a, into a lake. It has all those ripples. It hurts all them, just like a ripple effect. But anyways, I want to thank you for allowing me to come on and spread all this because I like to help people. You are actually helping me help people. Well, you're helping me help people too. And I think we talked about it a little bit. You know, if if 2,000 people listen to this podcast or more and it only helps one person, I think that we did our uh-huh. job. I think we did our job. And I cannot thank you enough again for jumping on the show and being open candid and honest with your story and where you're at now i can't wait to see you grow i can't wait to see where your need and want for helping people takes you because i truly believe that if you continue this mindset and continue this want of helping others i I think the sky's the limit for you Al. i think that your life has just begun. Your new life has just begun in this. I think this, so too. And I can't wait to see where it takes you. If there's anything that I can do to help you out, please let me know. Um, I can't wait to see you at the event in uh, October in San Antonio. For everybody listening, if you want to go to that event, October 14th, 15th, San Antonio, Texas, the Great Londini Meetup benefiting Tad Saw, Train a Dog, Save a Warrior. Come on out, get your tickets. You can find the link at whatmakesfire.org or thegreatlandbeauty.com. Click on that events tab and you'll be able to find the link to get your tickets. Much love to y'all. Al, again, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, thank you. Yeah. You have a great time, AJ. Say that one more time. You have a great time, AJ, my friends. You have a good karma day yourself, brother. Thank you again. What makes us fire? Tell the next one. All right, everybody, that was Al. I told you his story was a bit crazy. And the fact that he goes into the lifestyle and how that kind of tied into everything, it just blows my mind that he was talking so nonchalantly about it and very open and honest about it. Listen, there's things in our lives that we do that we shouldn't be ashamed of as long as they're not hurting anyone else or ourselves. I think Al took it a little bit too far and I think he realizes that as well. But he's learned something from all this. He wants people to have a good karma kind of day. You know, we always say, and he said this, we always say karma is going to get them. Karma is a bitch. But you got to remember, there's good karma too. What you put out there will come back to you good and bad and Al is a firm believer in that and I love the fact that he's sharing his story to try to help others to help keep him from making the decision that he made he was one of the lucky ones he survived and with that survival opportunity he's doing his best to make a change in the world for the better 
And I can't thank him enough for that and for sharing his story. Al, brother, thank you again. Before I sign off, everybody, again, I just want to remind you of the Great Londini Meetup in San Antonio, Texas, October 14th and 15th. Get your tickets at thegreatlondini.com or at whatmakesusfire.org. Also, November 11th and 12th, the Break the Silence concert series benefiting the What Makes Us Fire Foundation and the city of Webb City, Missouri. It's just north of Joplin, Missouri. Go get your tickets. Come out. Hang out with us. Enjoy the music. It's going to be an amazing time, and I cannot wait to see you guys there. If anybody out there is needing to talk to somebody right now, you don't necessarily have to be in that state of mind of thinking about suicide to call this number. You can be wanting to not get to that state. The National Suicide Prevention Hotline is 100% free, anonymous, and confidential. Make the call. Get the help. It's worth it. You're worth it. The number is 1-800-273-8255. Again, the number is 1-800-273-8255. If making that call is just not for you, that's okay. Suicidepreventionlifeline.org is an amazing website where you can get some really, really, really good information and utilities and tools to help you on your mental health clarity. And it's just an amazing, amazing website that I don't think gets utilized enough. Thank you all for supporting the What Makes Us Fire Foundation. We are growing. We're trying to get to that point where we can start sending our civil service members to the facilities that they truly want to and need to go to to get help. If you would like, you can make a donation at whatmakesusfire.org. All proceeds go to the What Makes Us Fire General Fund, which help us grow the podcast, grow the nonprofit, and hopefully soon be a nationwide nonprofit that helps all of our civil service members live for tomorrow. Much love to you all. Have fun. Stay safe. Be the change you want to see in the world without allowing the world to dictate how you see that change happen. Be the best version of yourself. Put that out in the world. And I promise you, the world around you, it gets better. Peace.